Hey everyone, welcome back to the Wool Lab Podcast. I'm James Marshall and man, we're flying through season two. Lots of great guests and another one of the greats on here for you today. But before we get into it, I need to make a mention of our sponsors. Firstly, Straight Face Razors. They've come on board with a mission to solve the problem of ever having to shave with a blunt razor. So what they can do is deliver a sharp five blade razor to your door with 50% off discount. Mind-blowing stuff, absolutely mind-blowing. So to order, head to wallad.com, click the straight face logo down the bottom and the discount will be applied, all ready to go. Also, Todd's Racing are on board and I love this. Champion harness trainer Regan Todd, he just wanted to sponsor the podcast basically because he's a lad. So go do him a favour and follow Todd's Racing on Facebook and Twitter. It'll be much appreciated by everyone. Also, if you want some great coffee, get yourself some Wadley Coffee Beans made by Pomeroy's. Lots of great feedback on how good these coffee beans are, so go get amongst it. Anyway, let's get to it. Roll the intro, please. Now today we have one of the greats on the show. He started off as a Wellington Lion sensation before coming a Highlander legend, leading them to their first ever Super Rugby title. He's played for the Mighty Stags down in Southland and of course he reached the ultimate heights of becoming an All Black. For the last three years he was over in the UK playing for the Wasps, which I'm really looking forward to hearing all about. And above all, like all my guests are, this man is an absolute lad, one of the greats. It is Lima Sopawanga. Welcome mate, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks, bro. Awesome to be here. Love watching your podcast over the sort of you know the last couple of months, especially in lockdown. Um, you've, had, you've had some pretty crack up guests <laughs> and uh, some pretty cool stories, you know, um, along the way. And uh, it's uh, it's cool to be on here today. And you know, hopefully uh, somebody else can get something from it too. Yeah, another crack up guy today, and cool stories to come. Looking forward to yeah. it. <laughs> but how <laughs> how is isolation? Obviously, um, you've been there for how many days now? Bro, honestly, I couldn't tell you how many days I've been here, <laughs> to be fair. I'm just, you know, like, my Survival head's above mode. water, bro, and I'm just I'm just trying not to drown, you know. Like, we got three kids, three and under, and, um, yeah, we're in Auckland at the moment at, at the Stanford Plaza. But to be fair, the the accommodation and the food here is unbelievable. Um, so that's a bonus. But, yeah, I, I, I think it might be sort of day five or day six, and yeah. – it's just all morphing into one and we're just <laughs> trying to get to uh, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. And, and then, yeah, we should be, uh, we should be good. And hopefully I'm still alive by then. <laughs> How are you spending your day? Three girls under, under three, did you say? Yeah. yeah three girls, three and under. Oh, wow. um, so we usually, we usually wake up, like right, the girls are still a bit jet lagged. Yeah. So depending on what sort of, you know, sometimes they're going to be at it like, five o'clock and sometimes they're going to bed at 11 o'clock at night it's just we just uh, it's, it's literally just the, the luck of the draw bro and then yeah just during the days we just try and just have a bit of fun bit of drawing um you know a few movies a few obstacle courses uh we try to get out for some walks yeah. um twice a day you sort of get um at this one it's you're allowed out twice a day for half an hour I'm pretty sure you get more freaking free time in prison, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but but that's all we got, and that you know we we'll, we'll we'll take that man, we'll take that, and then uh, we also sometimes they're sort of having sort of maybe two baths a day, you know, just to kind of get the take up time. get the time to yeah, you know, they wake up, have a bath, that's an hour, you know, just before you go to bed, oh, that's another hour, you know, so stuff like that, bro. Oh, that's it. pretty much what's keeping us going. How long has it been since you've been away from New Zealand? Bro, it's been three years since I've been home. Oh, you haven't so, come back once, true. No, nah, I haven't come back once. So I didn't plan to have it that way, but obviously yeah. with COVID and sort of everything that's happened, that's just how it's worked out. But um, back home now and just sort of counting the days until we can get out because, yeah, it, it was a little bit anticlimactic sort of coming into like landing in Auckland and being like, yes, I'm home. Yeah. But it's just like, nah. <laughs> Get over there, get in your freaking box and come out in 14 days, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's but crazy, yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's it's cool to be here and sort of look out the window and, and see the sun shining in the middle of winter because mm. uh, it's a bit different in the UK in winter, you know. <laughs> 100%. Did you and the family enjoy it over there, though? Yeah, we, we did enjoy it. 
Um, obviously, it's it's a little bit tough moving away to begin with, and I think the sort of first eighteen months of just trying to find our feet and find a community and and sort of build relationships was um was pretty tough. Mm. But you know, when it came to leave uh, the UK, we were we were pretty sad to leave. We'd met some unbelievable people and you know some real friends for life, and I think that's probably the beauty of of rugby. You know. We, we get to go on this journey and and the special thing about it is the people you meet and the relationships yeah. you build and we built some pretty amazing ones um, not only in the rugby circle but out of the rugby circle and pretty sad to to let those let those go but also know that those those relationships will be around for our lifetime so yeah we wouldn't have had those if we didn't if we didn't leave uh, New Zealand you know hundred percent you had a good Kiwi crew over there at Wasp with you too didn't you. Yeah, we had an awesome Kiwi crew. Um, we always used to um, give Brad stick and just say he was he was now English and he wasn't a Kiwi anymore. So he used to he used to get upset about that, you know. Like, be like, ah, you need to go over there with the Eng- English boys. You're not you're not Kiwi anymore, man. But we had him. Um, we had uh, Jimmy Gopith, um Jeff. Jeff ended up coming. Jeff to Among Ellen. Uh, Malakai was there. And then there was obviously a few um, a few Saffirs as well, which was pretty cool. Um, John De Jong. We had um, sort of Willie LaRue there at one yeah. point, Ashley Johnson, um, Nizam Khan. And we sort of had Nathan Hughes as well. So that was yeah. he was there too. He'd been in, in England for like six to seven years. And yeah, it was, it was a pretty cool um, international contingent there. Mm. So it was, it was awesome. And how did you find the rugby? Obviously, it's a massive shift i know as a 10 going from super rugby to the english premiership how did you find it yeah i think i think my transition there was probably a little bit a little bit hard to be fair i i probably went over there a little bit naive um and thinking that rugby was just all the same Mm. everywhere but the the premiership is definitely um definitely something pretty pretty hardcore to be fair mm. um and it's just a totally different style of rugby and a totally different way of playing the game and it's very attritional and it's very sort of like set piece orientated and and i didn't realize how like bad the winters were gonna be yeah so it probably didn't really suit my game um when i went over there i was probably kind of like i said a little bit naive to the fact that the game would be played totally different to how i'd been used to and um, yeah, it really took me a lot of time to adjust and I don't even think I fully adjusted and fully like sort of was able to reach the heights that I believed I could get to. But, you know, that's that's just the way it is sometimes. And I've, I've definitely learned a lot from that experience um, on the field and hopefully I can take that forward to, to France. Mm. So when you, when you went over there, did you try and get the guys to start playing the way that you wanted them to or did you just sit back and sort of play the style that they wanted to play? I tried to to fit in as quickly as I could, but it was really hard. You know, I um, they had obviously had Cipriani there the year before, yeah, and then you know I was kind of like a marquee signing to come in and sort of um, you know replace him and you know sort of steady the ship and and take us to you know better heights and whatever. But yeah, it just didn't. I just didn't eventuate like that, especially my first season. I just found it really sort of difficult because I didn't know the guys and the guys didn't know me and sort of the way I didn't realize how, I didn't realize how much being around guys continuously for like a certain amount of years really helped your game. Like I, I'd played with Aaron Smith for eight years. I played with Ben Smith for eight years. And so by the time I had left, you know, I'd, I had had those guys around me all the time. And to be fair, I was just like, oh, like if I look back now, I was probably like, man, those guys took so much pressure off my shoulders. And, you know, I benefited from mm. from having those guys around. And my game ended up elevating um, because of those guys. Whereas when I went to WAS, I was, I was kind of like the it guy. And I think that I didn't really adjust to that that well. True. Yeah, that's interesting. That makes that makes sense. 100%. I, I get that because... Mate, like you say, those combinations that you grow and everything starts becoming a little bit more in- instinctive rather than planned and talked about and all that sort of stuff. So to have to go into the wash side without knowing anyone, having those connections with anyone, with the pressure of you as being the big marquee guy, mate, it makes it real tough. Yeah, 
It was, man. And then sort of the, the style of rugby we were playing, it wasn't really a style that um, I was used to. And it was just different. Everything was just different. And I, I couldn't – I think it was a little bit down to me as well because I – I wanted everything to be so much like home. Mm. Whereas if I maybe just embraced the English way of playing football, I think my transition would have been uh, so much easier. But because I was, I'd only known sort of one thing for, for so long. Yeah. When I came into a new setup, I was like, what is this? Like, this isn't rugby. <laughs> you know, like I was like, what, what is going on here? Like, <laughs> Why aren't we attacking uh, off the scrub? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was just like, oh, just, just little things, yeah. but it wasn't, it, it wasn't like their fault and it wasn't my fault. I just think that, um, yeah, maybe I could have been a bit more open-minded mm. to change. And I think that would have made things speed up a little bit better. And I would have gotten to sort of get on top of the ball a lot quicker. Yeah. And obviously you were playing under the roof at um, <laughs> Foresight Bar <laughs> to going over to the English winter. And you like you say, the conditions are completely different. Oh, bro, honestly, I didn't, like, looking back now, they, a lot of people talk about, like, seasonal depression, <laughs> and I was just like, what is that? Like, there, there's no such thing, and I look back now, I was like, yeah, there, there's such a thing as seasonal depression, <laughs> like, I'd be going to work at, like, 7.30, and it's pitch black, yeah. and then by the time it got, like, 9 or 10 o'clock, it's still, like, grey and sort of, like, half light, but more so dark, and then you jump in the car, to get home and it's like four o'clock or three thirty and it's like pitch black again and you're just like oh, this is this is just you know like this is just out the gate. Yeah. Like I knew something was bad in winter when I rang home one uh once and my mum looked at me and she was just like what's wrong with you? I was like what? She's like you look sick and it just like and I was just like I I didn't realise and I looked and I was like holy I've like lost my whole colour. Like <laughs> I hadn't seen the sun in months, eh? And she was like, like you look sick. <laughs> yeah, I was like, Fuck. but yeah, it was, it was those those winters. Um, yeah, there's they're, they're something else, eh? Yeah, oh, tough times. Anyway, like all successful careers, we've got a lot to get through on this one. So, um, like all stories, we need to start at the start. Take us back to the start for you. I guess the start for me, you know, like um, like you said in the intro, uh, Wellington boy. Uh, born and bred. I've got I've got five brothers and sisters, three brothers and two sisters. So yeah, grew up and grew up out in Lower Hutt. Um, played all my junior rugby at the Mighty Batoni. Oh. So 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 played out there. Um, had grew up sort of with the likes of um, you know like Mike Kying and Brad Shields and yeah. Um, Jordan Kahu and and TJ and and Adi and all them. So kind of just you know, we would we would cross paths um, on Saturdays, sort of playing those guys. So that was that was pretty cool. And then um, lived out in the hut most of my life. Well, actually, all of my life um, out in Ellis Town. And then I went to Hut Billy High in my first high school year. And so I was out there with sort of all my friends who had grown up with around the neighbourhood. And then in my year ten, year or four form year. Um, it was probably about a week to go before school started. And I was like, oh, we better go get my, my uniform to um, get ready to go to Hut High. And my mum sat me down and she was like, oh, no, nah, you're not going there anymore. I was like, what? She's like, no, nah, you're, you're going to all boys school in Wellington College. Oh, and I was sure. just like, I was just sat there just like gobsmacked. Like, yeah. I, and I was like, you know, like spewing at her, like, why the hell would I go there? Like, I don't know anybody. Like, I had never heard of Wellington College before. <laughs> My mum was like, nah, you're going there and that's that. And I was just like, nah, but all my friends, you know how you yeah, are when yeah. you're like 13, oh, 14 yeah. years old, you just think. And I was at a co-ed school too. So, you know, I was kind of like walking around thinking I was like the guy, you know, like, yeah, this is my school, you know, <laughs> trying to be like Mr. Cool Guy, you know. You would have been though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was me and my mate Jordan Kahu and like we were just like figures thieves. So, you know, we were we were that guy, you know, the Dax waxing your hair, the straightener out, that kind of thing, you know. <laughs> And so I was just like, nah, nah, I'm not going, I'm not going. And then she was like, okay, well, just give it to the first term. And if you if you don't like it, you can return. And I liked it so much that I ended up um, going back for second year seven, you know. 
<laughs> so, loved it. Yeah, after the first, yeah, so I loved it that much, man. I went back for second year seven, but that's how it kind of all began for me. You you were always a gun um, player back at college, though, as well, because eh? I remember watching your game. I, you might have been eighth form or ninth form by then. It was a, <laughs> <laughs> it was a quad tournament against uh, Nelson College, and you were you were running a muck out there one day. Yeah, we, we yeah, I was alright. I was alright. So yeah, I was, I was, yeah, I ended up um, being pretty decent at, at high school, um, which was sort of lucky for me, I guess. Um, and that probably helped a lot. Yeah. Uh, going forward, but yeah, those those tournaments were were real cool. I think we played sort of like Mitch Scott and like and and J Lo and that. Yeah. I think that year yeah, we yeah. played at uh, Nelson College. Yeah, I remember. That's the one. Yeah, I was. Funny because I actually I don't know if you know them, but do you know uh, J- Jeff and Karen Rackley? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do know Jeff Rackley. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we ended up getting billeted by them. Oh, true. Uh, me and one of one of the boys, and funny enough, um, they ended up having Joe Wheeler come over for dinner. Oh, sort really? Of, you know, like <laughs> yeah. Joe rocks up, you know, <laughs> with his freaking jandals on, and he's like, "Oh, g'day, boys." You know, we're, you know, we're just like two quiet kids, you know, like. Yeah, <laughs> from 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 the city, we're like, frick, who's this big white guy like with this big ugly grin on his face? You know, like couldn't shut him up. And we were just like, oh, yes, yeah, yeah, you know, like not yeah, giving yeah. him much because so sure. Yeah, but yeah, no, nah, that, that's that's one of my memories from that tournament. That's crack up. And so you made New Zealand schools after that year. Oh, it's funny because in my seventh form year, probably one of the like I've never been so heartbroken in my life before. Oh, yeah. So I was just like. Yeah, but I was young, so I was just like, nah, I can't, I can't, I can't leave like this. Like, I was like, nah, I'm going back to school. Yeah. So I missed out on my seventh form year, and then on my eighth form year, I actually ended up making New Zealand secondary schools. That was purely for rugby, was it? <laughs> Wasn't for your academics? Nah, nah, so I was actually not too bad at yeah. school. Like, I, I didn't need to go back academically. Yeah. But I, I wanted to go back for sport, and it was, we actually had sort of like five or six guys who went back. Yeah. And they kind of like put us in our like our own class, bro. And yeah, we had sure. like um like special periods where we didn't actually start school till like eleven thirty. Oh yeah. And, and and things like that. Yeah. So yeah. it was uh, it was actually wild, man. Like the teachers didn't even te- like treat us like students. They almost treated us like we were sort of like first year uni kind of thing, you know, like semi pro athletes. Yeah, yeah, it was actually like, you know, sort of the era just before, you know, like before all that kind of like Sky TV stuff came in and schools like started having like proper curriculum, Yeah. whereas we were kind of like, they were like, oh, what do we do with all these guys who are coming back? And they kind of stuck us all together and we would like only have like two classes a day and like some of our classes were like go to the gym or like some of them were like, oh, you're supposed to be running fitness, but we were down at McDonald's kind of like (laughs) just hanging out and stuff like that and like just wagging school and, and things like that and just making sure we were there for, for rugby and footy, but it was one of the best years of my life oh, going back. How good is that? And then obviously you were into the Wellington Lions set up pretty young. I remember you playing for them. It must have been about 19. Yeah, so I left school in 2009 and 2010 was the year that Jamie Joe was coaching. Yeah. So I would have been, yeah, I would have just been 18 that year. Oh, true. Um. Yeah, and he and we were sort of all in the academy together. And, yeah, I remember just going to sort of those dog sessions at like 6 o'clock in the morning, you know, those, those sessions. So I was going there at 6, and then I was I was going to my job that I had, and I was like washing cars because this is when I, I had I'd never had like sort of money grow, at school, like had no job. I was just too busy playing sport. Yeah. So I was like, oh, what do I want to do? Like go to uni or make some money. So I was like, okay, I'll try and make some money. So I was getting like a, you know, you get your first PU contract and it's like, I think mine was like 12 grand for the year. And I was just like, (laughs) yeah, I was like, oh man, I'm rich, you know? Like, So I'd have to go to training from six to like 7.38. And then I went and washed cars Yeah. um, down at uh, Mitsubishi, just sort of by the basin there, you know, when you come around and there's that big sort of like, car yard there on the corner so i used to work there by washing the cars who had and the cars had come in for like services and one of their things they got a complimentary wash yeah and i remember just sort of like washing all the cars and, and things like that and 
you know, I'd find like um, underneath their seats like two dollars and stuff, and I had <laughs> no money at the time, bro. And I had no food, so I'd like take that two dollars and go put it in the machine and get some chips and and a cookie so I could have some food, bro. I was fucking so poor. And I just remember just washing cars, thinking, "Fuck, man, I've made it. I've made it." You know, and I'd get my pay at the end of every month and be like. Ah, what a life. I think it was like 400 bucks. True. How like, much of yes, that was loose man. change? <laughs> oh, man, I tell you what, there was a lot of loose change that I'd found and fucking gone and, you know, put, yes, there's a dollar Coke and there's like a cookie time. Man, I was I was, I was scrounging around a lot back in those days, but I did that. Yeah, I did that for um, ages, um, sort of until we – just before they were going to name that first Lions squad. And then, yeah, I ended up get, be, being picked in it. Mm. Um, funnily enough, I, I didn't think I had a had a shot, but I had some pretty solid, like, one-off games where I think Jamie Joe actually came and watched because oh, yeah. he – I played for OBU and he played for OBU. So yeah. I think he came a lot to those games to sort of more so watch his mates or, you know, catch up and – yeah. drink on the bank or whatever yeah. and uh, I just happened to be playing and some I think some of the games he watched I actually went pretty decent so I think that's actually how I ended up getting picked to be fair. True and how was it going into that setup as a young 18 year old must have been pretty intimidating as a 10 but from the outside you always looked like a real confident guy like someone who um, was happy to be running the cutter and didn't matter who was who was around did, were you. Did you always feel like that? Yeah I always felt um I always felt confident, but I never felt like too overawed by it all. But I was always like underneath it all. I was like shaking or yeah. I was like super, super excited. And back then, some of the guys that were still playing ITM, because I, I think it was kind of just a, it was just phasing out of that period where All Blacks weren't playing ITM. Yeah. But we we still had a few. Like we had Namir Tialata, um, you know, like guys like Petty Weepu playing. Um, Ronnie Soyalo um, and like Nonu and that was we're still sort of around the place. Yeah. So it was kind of cool to just sort of rub shoulders with those guys, and I was, I, I was just like a sponge and just so excited to be around them and just so nervous. But I also sort of had this like fear of of being like shit, you know, or like them being like fuck this guy shit, like what a waste of what a waste of money bringing this guy in. So I always uh, was just trying my best out there, like to not, to not be scared or to not sort of mess up. So I think that kind of worked in my favor a little bit. And yeah, it was just an exciting time, I reckon. And you got the starting spot before the end of the season, eh? And um, I think you guys made the final that year. Yeah, I ended up, so I was on the bench for like four games because Father Tony Philly was, um, was playing and he was, he was actually someone who, who took me under his wing and um, who guided guided me a lot and really helped me. And um, that's something I'll, I'll never ever forget as a young guy it was someone who was sort of older, mm. just really giving someone young the time of day. And that's something that's really stuck with me throughout my career as well, just to just to always remember that. And, and um, yeah, he, he ended up helping me a lot. I, I was on the bench for like four games and then I came on against Mono too and then um, I think Tix actually um, got an intercept with like three minutes to go and he ran the length of the field and um, scored and we lost. But oh, I just remember being out there just thinking, fuck, this is, this is, this is next level. Like this is too much for me. Eh? Like yeah. I remember thinking, oh man, this is not um, club rugby anymore. Like this is just a level that I've never been exposed to. And I was just like, holy shit, I don't know if I'm, if I'm made for this, but you know, as as I got more confident and and things, um, I started to sort of believe in myself a bit more. I started to um, really enjoy myself in that environment, but it was pretty daunting going in there initially, and and just being around all those old guys. And Wendell was like riding me hard as well. Like he was so he was actually so mean to me as a trainer. Okay. I remember like some days, yeah. I remember so I remember we were we were doing like um, like fifteen on fifteen, and obviously I was in like the guys who weren't going to play um, kind of thing, yeah. Uh, like the non-23. And I remember the ball being kicked down and I remember chasing it and Jose, Jose picked the ball up, Jose Gear. Yeah. He picked the ball up and he probably had about 30 meters between me and him. And um, he, so he picks it up and he's running dead straight at me, like full, full tip. 
Oh, and I, don't want and that. so I like, <laughs> no, yeah. So I'm like, oh man, I'm just gonna have to put my head down and like, and like brace and just get ready to get fucking steamrolled. <laughs> and so I'm just like getting ready. And at the last like two meters, yeah. he just steps and goes around me. Like he, he's <laughs> like running dead straight. And then at the last two meters, like I full on plant and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to bang it. Like put my body on the line and try to get in front of him. Yeah. And he just like goes meow and goes around me. And then Wendell just like, Lema, what are you doing? What is that? And I was just like, I just remember turning around, just thinking, oh my gosh, that is not what I want to see or what I want to hear. Like the trainer's just belting me on the side. I'm like, get back and chase him. I'm like, bro, the cunt's gone 40 and scored the try. What am I supposed to do? He's a like world-class winger. Oh, 18 years old, like 80 kilo dripping wet. Yeah. And he reckons, oh, I just try to brace myself. And I think I must have closed my eyes because he – Ended up going around me. Oh, that's so that's classic. when I was like, oh, man. But yeah. then you obviously impressed Jamie Joe enough to play a lot of games towards the back end of that season, eh? Yeah, I must have. Um, it's, it's funny you, you try to think back to it now, but when you're so young, I think you're just so oblivious to it all. Mm. So I was kind of just like, oh, yeah, whatever. This is just normal. But now that I think about it, I'm just like, oh, shit, I can't even really remember because when I was in that moment, I was just, you know, like it was – just it was like you're in a dream you know like yeah. you're in a trance you're just like man this is wicked like um, Pity Wigby's passed me the ball my unknown is at 12 you know like Jose Gears on one wing and yeah. you know Corey Jane comes in every now and then because he's with the All Blacks or whatever and it was, it was just it was just crazy yeah. you know like you're just kind of just like living this dream and you don't really stop to think like how cool it actually is yeah. and so now when I get asked about it I'm just like oh fuck and I wish I stopped and smelt the roses a, a little bit on the way up, you know. Hundred mm, percent. And then Jamie Joe obviously got you down to the Highlanders. He took took you down with him. Was that a hard decision for you? Did you have other options? I, I imagine you were yeah. probably wanting to be a cane as a young kid. Yeah, always wanted to be a hurricane. You know, I, I went to you know Athletic Park and obviously the Cates, and so I'd be going down there, you know, like watching Jimmy Gopher and like Cruder and then. All those guys, so I was like dead set on being a hurricane. And during that Lions, during that Lions campaign, um, actually Mark Hammett came and and sort of told me that I was going to be in the Hurricanes by the training squad. Oh yeah, yeah. So I was kind of, I was just like, yes, like stoked. My dream came true, you know. Like I'm about to be in the Hurricanes, you know, albeit the one in the training squad. Mm. But I'm 18 years old at the time. I don't, I don't really care. I'm just like, yes, like pumped up about it. And then sort of two weeks later, Jamie Joe. Um, gave me a call and he was just like oh hey mate I want you to come down to Dunedin um, I was like oh there's, there's no point I'm already in a wider training squad you know because I just thought oh he's only why, why am I going to be picked in a full squad I've already just been given a wider training so I was like nah yeah I'm, I'm all good like sweet as don't worry about it and he's like what do you mean and I was just like oh I'm already in a wider training group squad he's like nah I want to give you a full contract Wow. and I was just like oh shit yeah. you know like and I was just like, oh, uh, okay. And then, you know, classic Jamie Joe, he was like, well, you got uh, you got a week to think about it. Let me know. Um, and then just hangs up the phone, you know? Like, I was just like, oh, fuck. That's <laughs> so, I was just like, oh. so I reckon, I didn't know this, but that was the year I made the um, Hurricanes wider squad. So if you stayed, I would probably have never been a Hurricane. That's buzzy. Oh, really? Yeah, so, so I got we... the wider squad when you obviously went to the Highlanders. I didn't know this until right right then. That's crazy. <laughs> oh, that's mental. Yeah, so I, so I went back to the Hurricanes, bro, and I was just like pleading with them like, oh, I want to stay, I want to stay, um, you know, give me a full contract. But at the time they had – Cruds and I can't remember who else. Maybe they had Dan Kirkpatrick as well. Yeah, and Bodie um, was in and around yeah. there too. Yeah, so we were all like the same age. So I was just like pleading like, and they were, they were like, nah, 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 just just widers. And then it was actually Ma who convinced me to go down, eh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so he had obviously, we had finished the captain's run at the Caton and like disloyal and all this kind of <laughs> stuff, you know, all these things you have in your head because you're like, you know, he's, he's, he's been at the hurry for so long and like, it helped me out heaps that year. And then he pretty much told me that like, you're not going to learn, you're not going to learn much holding tackle shields for him. Mm. You know, like the best way to learn is to be out there and actually be involved in the games. And so 
that was something that I like took on board. And it was hard, hard for me to like leave at the time because the Highlanders, you know, they weren't what they are now. Like they were pretty, sh- they were like shit, like wooden spooners, you know, like we went down there, like we didn't have like a proper gym or anything like that. Yeah. Like the budget was terrible. Like everything was terrible down there, but yeah, he, he kind of just convinced me sort of like to go down and just chase my dream a different way. And, and, and that's kind of what I decided to do is just head down with a whole bunch of young boys who Jamie Joe had sort of picked because, you know, he wasn't going to get the top All Blacks to go down there and yeah. he wasn't going to get sort of the guys who had been around Super Rugby long enough, you know, like sort of those those guys who were really, really solid mm. Super players. He wasn't going to convince them. So he he sort of convinced sort of young dudes who were, were hungry and who had potential and then he mixed that with um, sort of, you know, sort of the off-cut guys, guys who who other franchises sort of didn't think were, you know, really good rugby players. You know, you're, mm. you're talking, you know, you're Jared Hoyatzas and, you know, at the time Aaron Smith and, and guys like that. So, yeah, yeah took the leap and, and headed down to the deep south. Wow, that's crazy. Shout out to Martin Nona and Jamie Joe for giving me a career <laughs> and yourself. That's crazy. <laughs> Man, that's me <mental. laughs> That's crazy. Down in the Highlanders, it always seems to be like a real cool environment down there. You guys always seem to have a real tight bond on and off the off the field. Um, we've had a few guys on already who shared some pretty loose stories, but there seemed to be quite a cool co- culture down there where you guys seem to get along. Yeah, it was really cool, and that was probably something that Jamie Joe had really focused on was that when we went down there, there was probably only a handful of guys who were actually from the region. Like we only had Ben Smith from the region and, and maybe sort of one or two other guys. And so his, his focus was really on all of us becoming like a family and becoming tight knit because all we really had down there was each other. Like none of us had like childhood friends down there. None of us had gone to uni down there. None of us, you know, had 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 family or anything. So the only way we were gonna um, enjoy Dunedin is is if we got really really close together. And I think that was the beauty of JB Joe was that he was able to bring people together, um, different cultures, different backgrounds, um, and whatnot. And um, yeah, really really make us sort of bond. And then your old man Jamie Joe gave you the start first round. How was that? Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't by choice. I don't think he would have picked me until round twenty if, if he had a <laughs> if he had a choice to be honest. But he was fucking scraping the barrel there. Uh he, he had actually enticed Slady to come down from the Crusaders. Uh and so obviously Slady was meant to be the, the number one guy because I was just coming down as some someone to learn. Uh Slady actually broke his jaw in the first um, preseason game, bro. Oh yeah, he broke his jaw. Yeah, and so I ended up um, being handed the start. And funnily enough, we were playing the Hurricanes at Westpac. True. And I, I just remember. So you know, we ran out first, and I remember um, standing there halfway with our kickoff, and I was bouncing the ball up and down. You know, like okay, sweet, this is going to be me. And then that Wiz Khalifa song came on. Black oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they came out like an NFL team, bro. They came out like an NFL team. And I just remember standing halfway thinking, what the fuck am I doing here? Like, this is not the one, bro. Like, bro, their back line was Pity Reaper at nine. They had Cruden at 10. They had Ma'a at 12. They had Snakey at 13. They had Jose on one wing. Jules on the other, and they had Corey Jean at fullback. Stacked. <laughs> bro, and I was just standing in the middle, like, about to kick this ball off, like, oh, my God, I, I'm not I'm not qualified for this. <laughs> but we ended up, we ended up winning, uh, we ended up winning the game that day, bro, which yeah. was crazy. Um, we won the game, and I actually got, um, I actually got first try score of that game, and it's funny because one of my, one of my really good mates, his old man, uh, paid for his trip to Las Vegas because he put 200 on me to score first try. Wow. And I think I was paying 35 on the nose. <laughs> Panting. <laughs> yeah, I know. He put, he put it on a guy paying 30, yeah, 35. He put 200 <laughs> smack bang straight up. First try score and I came in. Oh, that's good stuff. <laughs> and you kept your starting spot after that week? 
Yeah, I kept that. We played the Chiefs. Played the Chiefs. Um, I kind of hurt my shoulder, and then I wasn't able to go to South Africa after that. We played the Chiefs. We won that game, and then we went to Africa after that. But I, I, I done my shoulder. I think I was, I think I was actually on Liam Messam to be fair. But I, w- I was like a skinny, bony kid, bro. Like playing against these proper dudes. So I, I definitely wasn't ready for super. My body wasn't ready for super rugby at that time. Physically, yeah. Yeah, physically, I was just like, nah. I wasn't. I definitely wasn't up to it. And and then there was a moment early in your career that most rugby players dread, is, especially as, as a 10, is the sub before half time. Talk me through that oh, one. Oh, 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 man. I, I, I love talking about this story because I actually look back on it and I laugh about it a lot. <laughs> and like all my brothers and all my really good mates, we talk about it a heaps. It's, it's actually a, a funny memory now, but at the time, I just wanted to dig myself the biggest hole and jump in it and just hope someone threw a bomb and then blew me up, to be fair. <laughs> It was, it was honestly the worst thing ever. I don't think I've played um, such bad rugby in my whole entire career, to be to be honest. Mm. But yeah, it was a it was a really really bad day at the office. We were playing the cheaters, and like you know, like the cheaters aren't traditionally that great, and we're playing them, and it just just didn't click for me. Like nothing, nothing went good. I think we went into the sheds at half time, maybe. 28 7 down or yeah 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 something like that i i'd given away like two intercepts i had two shots on goal pretty much in front one i shanked and one i hit the post the only good thing i did was set up kate pookie in the corner and oh, i missed pookie. that goal kick as well True. yeah i just bro, it was it was just you know think it was just a bad bad day and then Jamie Joe being who he is, he he just said, "Nah, I've seen enough of today." And fucking pulled me by the ear and took me off the pitch. And it, honestly, it was the worst feeling of my life. But looking back now, is something that I look back on and I think, "Oh man, I grew so much from that moment." Yeah. And you know, had I had so many laughs from it, and you know, I always laugh about it because I asked him the year that he was leaving. We were sort of at the end of year, and I was like, "Bro." I asked him straight up because I was like pissed and I was it still irked me that he that he kinda like subbed me, eh? Hey? Like three minutes, like, come on bro, you, you could have <laughs> just waited like three minutes and then done the old oh I see if they made a substitution at half time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't have to do the walk of shame <laughs> like, like that. But um Yeah, he, and he just said, Nah bro, you needed to be subbed and uh that that that's a lesson learned and um he's like if you've made it past the thirty seventh minute in the game, you know you're having a good game. <laughs> they just walked off drinking his Heineken or Spates or whatever he was drinking at the time. And I was just like, oh, so every time I kind of, it's funny because I look at the clock um, sort of near the end of the first half and it's past the 37th minute, I just have a little chuckle to myself most games and just look at the clock and I think, oh, yeah, so That's today's crazy. going all right, man. So you didn't want to come off, eh? Like you were, ha- you were keen to keep playing. No, I actually wanted to come off, but I was keen to at least go to half time oh, and yeah. like save face like that. But yeah. I knew that, like I, I was like, somebody save me! Man. Yeah, like I am drowning here. Throw me a life raft! <laughs> like get me out of this mess. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I was hoping that he would have just waited till half time and done the thing. Like but most people, that's that was one of Jamie Joe's uh, great lessons. That's cracker. And then, and another memory I have of you, everyone remembers one of the most razoriest plays in Super Rugby history. I remember standing at fullback, you turn around, kick it over your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, so we'd been analysing you guys uh, a whole heap and um, Brownie just reckoned that if I shape, because we wanted to just do a normal dink over top, mm. but he said that Corey Jane, you know, like Corey Jane's a mastermind, you know, defensively and things like that. He's, he's, he's so... So clued up, he said he'll pick he'll pick that cue up straight away and yeah. he'll probably come back. But he said if you if you let the line come to you and you turn around, then they they probably don't know what you you're about to do. Yeah. And he was dead serious. This is Monday morning. And he's like, Why don't you just turn around and kick it over the top of your like head, like backwards? And I was like, Are you are you joking? <laughs> he's like, Nah, I'm dead serious. Like, I reckon you can do it. And I was just like, are you serious? And he's like, no, no, yeah, I'm dead serious. Like, I reckon we can do it. We'll have, we'll, you turn around, Malachi will switch, and then another switch, and then you just like pop one over your shoulder. And I was just like, oh, sweet. But he was the kind of coach that 
could make you feel like you could do anything. Yeah. So he, he, he was just like, yeah, sweet. I was like, okay, sweet. But the whole week, bro, it didn't come off once. Like, oh, real? Like, kick it straight up in the air. <laughs> one time it hit my face. <laughs> like, one time I missed the ball. Like, everyone was just thinking, what the fuck? Why are we doing this stupid play? Yeah. Um, and then we had that line out, and we had actually called, called for a box kick. Mm. And then um, Waisake, he just looked at me. He was like, bro, do the kick. I was like, oh, shit. I was like, oh, you're sweet. And then I just... I just yelled cancel to Nuggy and then Nug just looked at me like, oh shit, he's going to do it. And he just knew what to do. He's just like, yeah, sweet. So he kind of, I just gave him the eyes and he like looked at me. He's like, oh, no way. This guy's going to actually do it. And we ended up doing it. Fuck, I wish we had scored. Oh, up. so one close, eh? The greatest, one of the greatest tries ever, man. It still hurts me that we didn't score off that, but yeah, it's a good little highlights reel for me. Oh, is it? What? One of the great plays. Shit, that was good stuff. And the other other thing, obviously, in your Highlanders career was the 2015 final, and I guess the year you were on absolute fire that whole season. I think you got um, Player of the Year for the season, and capped off with the final. Yeah, it was just a just the year where I think sort of um, in two, 2014 we were able to make the playoffs for the first time, and we played the Sharks, and um, and we obviously lost in Durban, but that was kind of when Tony Brown came on board and, and sort of Jake um, had made a lot of changes and sort of we had sort of learnt from our mistakes. But we, we ended up making the, the playoffs for the first time in 12 years. And after that game, I just just knew that there was more in this team. And, mm. and there was a couple of us who kind of sat there after Durban knowing that, like, OK, we lost. But I reckon if we just kind of, like, ride this out and, like, stick together, then I think there's – you know, there's definitely juice to be squeezed in this lemon, you know what I mean? Mm. And there were, there were some pretty special characters in that team. We had, um, you know, like Alex Ainley and someone who was really good for us was Shane Christie. And mm. he was someone that I really competed with in the preseason, just like in the gym um, and fitness and stuff. He, you know, he's just like he's just like a mad dog, just so <laughs> hungry. So just, you know, like he wouldn't is. let up, yeah. you know, and I, it was just infectious. It was just infectious. I think we had that kind of like, just if he was doing like extras, like I would jump in and do extras with mm. him or like, and that was kind of like what had happened that year. And I think our confidence just grew and grew and grew. And, um, you know, me as a player, my confidence grew as well. Just being around um, Brownie and sort of building better relationships with like Nuggy and um, Bender. And, you know, I had the, had the two Fijian boys sort of, catching my wayward cross kicks and, and scoring <laughs> cool tries. And yeah, it, it just, you know, it's, it, it's a funny old thing when you start to build momentum, eh? it, yeah. just, it just snowballs and the the confidence that we had in each other was, was just um, second to none. And, and I think it probably helped that we were um, sort of like the landers and, and that like coming into the playoffs, we were on a roll, but no one really, knew that we were on a roll, like the media weren't blowing us up or anything like that. Mm. And, and we didn't sort of have the the massive names on, on paper. Like we did, like we had, you know, Bender and, and Nuggy and, and Muller, they were kind of like our big three. And then, but we had like a really workman-like Ford pack. Mm. And so no one really gave us a chance to be fair. And I think that was kind of like, um, something that worked in our favours that we kind of just flew under the radar mm. um, a, a little bit. And, yeah, we ended up tipping the Chiefs and then going to Sydney. And then, yeah, we ended up beating beating the Canes, which, you know, I, th I thought was probably one of the best games to be a part of, you know. And probably as a neutral, it was probably a really good game to watch. Yeah. What, what, what stands out from that game for you? Oh, obviously, obviously Marty's drop goal. Um, that stands out. But I, th I think probably when I knew it might be our day was when uh, Jules dropped the ball with the line wide open. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he got a pass from Brad. And, the, like, I think we were on the ropes right then. Yeah. And I think when that – when he had just dropped the ball, you know, like Jules never drops the ball. It was just – I don't know what happened. It, maybe he just had a quick look at the, at the corner and was wide open. And um, that's when I kind of thought – 
oh man, the the rugby gods looking down on us today. Like, <laughs> I, th- I think this could be could be our day. And then we end up, you know, like Marty does the drop goal, and then uh, we get a scrum for a knock on, and we just kind of just mm. the Highlanders fashion and just you know, probably like four minutes to go, like, <laughs> pick and go to the sideline, pick and go, pick and go, and then kick it out, you know. <laughs> So you came off injured, eh? When Banksy came on, were you confident? Did you think he could handle the pressure coming off a poor ITEM Cup final? <laughs> <laughs> nah, me, me and Banksy always, um, we always would have the awesome um, chats during the week and like kicking comps all, all the time. So yeah. I always knew that he was a pretty cool customer. Eh? I think the thing with Banksy was that like, he actually has all the skills and stuff. I just think he's got to believe in himself more. Like, yeah. I actually think he's a better kicker than me, um, you know, most of the time. But I'll be in his head saying, like, how shit he is, <laughs> you know? And, and like, I'll be kind of, like, just chipping away. Whereas, like, my confidence, like, sort of never wavered. But whereas with, with Banksy, I just think he just needed a little bit of confidence in himself because he's actually, a, like, a top-quality footballer. Mm. Um, and the things that he can do. And I think some of the things he can do is, is better than me. It's just that his, his confidence sometimes, I just think that lets him down. But yeah. I knew when I came off, I was like, like my calves were shot. Like I, I literally couldn't walk. Yeah. And so I was like, he's not, he's, he has to do it. You know? like he, he has to. Like there's, there's no other guy that can do it. So I'm like, fuck, you know, you've got to do something, Banksy. I mean, he had been complaining all year that he was getting splinters. And then now he's, it's his moment. He's like, fuck, why are you coming off? I'm like, get the fuck on the field. I can't walk, you prick. <laughs> You know, like, oh my gosh, that guy complains all year. He's not getting any game time. Comes to the biggest moment, he's like, "Oh fuck, stay on the field, man." Oh well, he oh. came up trumps, didn't he? He he came up with the oh, good. Oh, he came up trumps, and he doesn't let anyone forget about it. Nah, like, does he? What? He's a bloody, he's a he's a top quality bloke, that guy. And we we got such a special relationship, and mm. yeah, nah, he 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 was pretty good for me at the Landers, and probably just. No, it was probably good for him as well. Yeah, for sure. At the end of that year, you made the, the All Black squad. So did you expect that call up? The form was that good that did you think it was going to happen? Nah, especially in a World Cup year. I didn't, I didn't think. I, I thought I was no chance. I just thought, oh, you know, just they'll just do what they do and go off the Oh, you know, you had uh, DC. I think Cruds was actually injured at the time, I think, maybe. Yeah. Um, Slady and, and Bodhi, so I was just like, oh, I'm, I'm well out of the equation. Yeah. But yeah, I was lucky enough to, to um, be involved, and then I got my shot in South Africa, which was pretty unbelievable, to be fair. Yeah, tough test match to start away in South Africa against the <laughs> massive South African forward pack as a team. <laughs> Not the easiest place to make your debut, but you obviously absolutely killed it that day. Stayed on, played the full 80. Got past the thirty-seven minute. Yeah, yeah, that was that was actually one of my things I'd written in my book. I, I just put the number thirty-seven before, uh, you know, I just sort of wrote it down and I just put thirty-seven um, next to sort of my game goals. Um, but yeah, I I ended up starting that game and I just thought I I couldn't believe that I was starting in South Africa. Mm. But yeah, it was actually um, pretty crazy and I just remember sort of putting the black jersey on and then like going to the mirror just before we were about to walk out and like splashing my face with water and then looking up and I just like saw myself in the mirror and I was just like, holy shit. Like I felt like I would just like put this like cloak of armor on and I was just like, oh man, I'm ready. Yeah. But it's funny because I, you know, like as a kid, I had dreamt about that moment my whole life that when I walked down the tunnel of Ellis Park, I actually felt like I had already been there so many times. Just because as a kid, my mind would wander and I'd just be like, yeah, like I'm going to play for the All Blacks one day and, you know, like it's going to happen. So it, so when it came to actually going down there, I, I was more excited by it than daunted, you know. Like That's kinda, cool. I was really excited by the occasion rather than, um, you know, pressured by it. Yeah. And I think that was because I had, had these silly dreams all, all the way through my childhood that I was going to be an All Black. And when it came to it, it was almost like it would – it, it had already happened. It was like deja vu. And mm. so I just ended up going out there th- with the mindset thinking like, if this is the one time you ever play for the All Blacks, 
you might as well just play the game of your life. Yeah. If you never play again, at least you know that, like, you got to do it your way. And so that was my mindset going into it. I was just thinking, just throw the kitchen sink at it, and if it's one test, then you, that, that's all right. That's okay. Mm. So you said it was 2015 when – um, you were named, so it was obviously World Cup year that later on that year. What was it like missing out on that? Did you expect to make that side? Like initially, I I didn't expect to make it, but after my South Africa test, I thought, man, what dude, young dude at 24 years old gets the debut in South Africa at 10 mm. um, and sort of like sort of lead the team to, to a win, not that I did it all by myself, yeah. but, you know, like that's a – pretty daunting sort of task to have your first test in in South Africa at Ellis Park and I thought yeah I think I've given everything that I can and and I was kind of sort of probably didn't help that maybe I had heard you know I was kind of probably listening to a bit of outside noise saying you know like he's going to the World Cup blah 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 blah, blah. but I knew in my heart that I'd given everything and so I I started to think that yeah actually you know what I I probably think that I deserve to go here mm. and you know like I'm signed on um, to be in New Zealand for a couple more years so you know that I'm not leaving or anything and and whatnot and yeah it just it just didn't didn't work out uh, for me and the selectors uh, went a different way which is which is cool but. Just goes to show you that, you know, like rugby is really one man's opinion. You know, you can, yeah. you can, you know, like another coach might've been like, yeah, he's coming to the world cup. Yeah. Like, you know, and we're sitting here talking about how, how, how was your world cup experience, et cetera. But, you know, it really just comes down to one man's opinion and, and whatnot. But honestly, bro, it was like, at the time it was like soul destroying. Oh, true. Like I remember just like, yeah, I remember just, it was Sunday and I remember, I remember getting the phone call and like my dad was working by his van and I remember just like, I remember that he was kind of like pottering around sort of cleaning up a few bits and pieces and I remember just being like, oh, dad. Um, and I was just like already like in my like tears and then, and I was like, oh, I didn't make the World Cup. And he was just like, oh, it's okay, son. You know, like I think, you know, he was probably more upset that – than what he led on but you know I just felt at that moment like telling my dad those words that I missed out on the World Cup I almost felt like oh man I, I sort of failed him and I failed my like brothers and sisters and I think all that kind of stuff was just going through my head mm-hmm. and I was just like I was like distraught eh? and mm-hmm. like I look back now and I just think oh man like it's crazy because you look back at, at that moment, you're like, oh, it's, that's not such a big deal. You yeah. Know? When you're in it. Time, everything sort of heals things, you know. And But at, when you're in the moment and you're in that sort of all-black bubble and, and you're, you're chasing you're chasing goals, you're chasing dreams, when you get that call, it's like, it's like soul-destroying. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I had some awesome people around me at that time and I think it was a Sunday, so – we ended up going out on a bit of a big bender on the Sunday night <laughs> me and two of my mates. And, you know, like they had work the next day, but they're out drinking with me till like freaking four in the morning. Um, but, you know, I, I was just like, it's just one of those things that you go through. And, like, you know, I look at people who have missed out on um, squads or, you know, like going to the Olympics right now. And, you know, mm. there are people missing out on all sorts of things. Um, with these big occasions coming up. And I just remember thinking, I just remember feeling like what it felt like. But being in this moment I am now, I just think like, oh man, the sun still rises and there will come another day where you kind of like look back on that and you're just like, oh man, I'm so much better for that experience. Yeah. But you can't see it when you're in that moment. Like, no matter what somebody tells you, you can't sort of get out of your, that hollowness that you feel, that real emptiness. But, yeah. You know, give it time and you you kind of just look back at it and you're just like, fuck, no one really cares, man. You know, unless you're, unless you're like, you're like a proper big dog, like in the big scheme of it, no one really cares. You know, like, <laughs> you're like Richie or TC, like, fuck, no one cares if you went to a World Cup and your career's finished, bro. Like, oh, remember me? I went to the 2015 World Cup, bro. Like, 
<laughs> no one gives a damn, you know. Yeah. So how long did it take you to deal with it? Because I know you've been a big advocate for mental health and uh, you've done some real good work in that area. So any sort of tips or anything about how you would deal with that if you're in the same spot again? Yeah, I think I would deal with it a lot better um, looking back now. Yeah. I think I use probably a lot of escapism uh, um to get me through and I wish I had I wish I had the tools then that I do now and I wish I had gone and sort of seek help from someone external whereas I kind of just bottled it up and probably um, bottled it into like I said escapism um, buying shit like going on benders all that kind of stuff whereas I you know like it was all well and good and fun but like to be honest, wasn't you know, helping like, yeah you get to that Sunday and like gravity's hit you hey, and you're just like oh man gra- it's, this is gravity and it's coming down bro and you know like it's, you're lying in your bed you're like oh man and then you, you know you try and you try because I think that would have really helped me and I think speaking to somebody um who is external from your sort of crew or someone who is completely away from the environment that you're always in. So it's not like your mum, your dad, or your your missus or your best friends. It's, you know, someone who doesn't know anything about rugby and, mm. or, you know, doesn't know. And then I think what they, what they end up doing is you actually verbalize what's going on in your head and you speak it out loud and you kind of think when you say some of the things that yeah. upset you or whatever, you're like, Bro, what's fucking wrong with you? <laughs> You're upset at that. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. And that, that was probably some of the things that I went um, through overseas or whatever is like actually going to speak to somebody about um, what you're feeling or what you're sitting in. Isn't that scary? And actually, it probably speeds up the healing process a lot. Mm. And when you get to do that, you end up moving on quicker and then your life just becomes so much easier. Mm. But I think as as men and especially as male rugby players, opening up and talking about our feelings isn't um, necessarily one of the first things that we think about when going through disappointment. We just think, ah, oh, fuck, we've just got to train harder. Mm. Just got to, um, you know, sacrifice more. You just got to, you know, do more gym sessions or, you know, not eat that Snickers bar or whatever. Actually, like if you if you go and talk to somebody and you're able to sort of air out what you're what you're actually feeling inside, then that tends to be the that tends to be what helped me. That's inspiring advice. Good stuff in the mid podcast, man. <laughs> That's powerful. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I don't know if it's powerful. It's probably just a bit of stupidity. I'm not trying to do it sooner. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, yeah. That's that's um, so true, though. It's no one's first nature to go and speak about, it, especially in the rugby environment. But you can feel, I can feel a bit of a shift at the moment. It's becoming more common. Guys are speaking out, which is encouraging others to do the same. So I think uh, the game's going in the right place. But um, like you say, it was it was never easy, especially back then, to go and try and talk to someone. Yeah. Yeah, they'll be like, fuck, sort your head out. Yeah. Like, fuck, I'm trying, man. Well, I'm coming to talk to you and you're just fucking laughing at me. But you found your way back into the All Black setup. I think you played about 18 games and then you decided to move over to the UK. So what was the reason behind that move? Yeah, it just came at a, at a I was kind of just at a crossroads, I thought, and I was in an All Black environment. It was very, very solid and um, obviously you had Bowie there and I just, I kind of just felt like um, no matter how good I was going to be playing, I don't think I could unseat seat Bowie at the time, you know, like he was, yeah. just, a, he was just like the double, um, you know, back-to-back world player of the year mm-hmm. and it, it, would just, it, it just seemed like um, the minutes I was getting off the bench just wasn't really... Um, cutting it for me like I loved being in the environment like loved being around the lads and 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 doing cool stuff and traveling the world and, and whatnot but I just felt like I was a bit part um, at times and sort of heading into I think also what sort of made me decide um, to leave in 2018 was what I had gone through in 2015 and 
I mean in the fact that I could control what was going to happen mm. um, between now and say 2019. Whereas if I made like if I had decided to stay, it, it still wasn't really fully in my hands. Yeah, whether or not I was going to go to a World Cup, like I could have done my knee and and been out, or you know, at the eleventh hour, the selectors could have been like, oh, actually, we're going to go a different way. Um, or, you know, or maybe my form might have dipped or or things like that. And it was, it was just like, I didn't want to be in a spot again where I had to go through that pain, I think. And like, I was confident in myself that I would have given everything. I didn't want to give everything and then get to a point where the selectors decided my fate. Yeah. Because, you know, like I wasn't a protected species, like in that team, you know, like the guys who are always going to make it, you know, mm-hmm. like your, your Aaron Smiths, your Ben Smiths, your Brodies, like those guys have nothing to worry about. Yeah. Whereas I was kind of just like one of those guys who was like Replaceable. in the squad, mm-hmm. but wasn't like, you know, like really secure. And and that's just, that was just like the nature, the nature of it. And so I didn't want to get to 2019 and, and be like, do everything that I think is possible and then come to come to the naming, not get named because of like the choice of, of somebody else. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to take my fate and my future into my own hands and be like, oh, you know what, I'm gonna do something else and and, and try something else. And and that's when I decided to go overseas. And you know, like looking back now, I'm I'm pretty pretty happy with that decision and mm-hmm. And, you know, I have no regrets about that decision at all. And, yeah, it was just one of those things that I just thought, oh, you know what, I'd I rather decide my own future rather than someone decide it for me. Mm. And, yeah, I might have gone to the World Cup, but at the end of the day, you know, who's to say that I, I was going to go? Yeah. Um, and that's probably what it came down to. Probably that fear of having to pick myself up again had I missed out. That was probably too big of a mountain for me to climb, I think. I reckon if I had have missed out, I, it wasn't worth the risk in my mind to go through all that again. So that's that's kind of where it lay. That's that's cool. That's cool to hear. And was it always wasps? Was it always the wasps that you were going to go to? Yeah, there were a couple of others, but you know, to be frank, wasps had the biggest offer. <laughs> <So laughs> Just really blew the others out of the water. <laughs> that was a huge offer. <laughs> yeah, so we went. So, so we decided to go there, you know. So, um, yeah, that's um, that's part of the reason why we went there. And uh, obviously, we had, we had different options, but yeah, that was that was. And I knew sort of Brad was going there as well. Yeah. So I knew Brad was going there. So I was kind of like happy that you know I was going to know somebody else, and it was an English speaking country and yeah. whatnot. And yeah, that's that's essentially what the decision came down to and sort of like the why and what I was feeling at the time and, and all that kind of thing. Very cool to hear. And now at the end of Wasps, you have signed with Leon, am I right? Yeah, going to Leon, going to France. True. Yeah, Talk me through this one because I know a lot of people are expecting you to come home this time around by the sounds of it, you know, you sort of miss New Zealand rugby, that sort of thing, but um, you've gone to France. Yeah, to be honest, you know, like it was – it was, I was pretty close to coming back to the Hurricanes. I really, you know, we were pretty close, uh, but it just kind of just didn't eventuate in the in the time frame that I needed it to. And I think it sort of just, yeah, it was just one of those things that we just decided because if we were coming back to New Zealand, we were going to come back for good. Yeah. And my my missus said like she didn't want to come back to. New Zealand and just spend a year and then take off again and try mm. and pan or, or anything like that. It would just be too hard. Like, yeah. why would you do that? Like, if you're away, you might as well stay away. And then when you come home, you actually come home and that's that. Yeah. Whereas I kind of was thinking, oh, yeah, well, I wouldn't mind coming back and and playing in New Zealand and then taking off again. But in her mind, she was just like, well, there's no real point. Like, what, what's the point of that? You'll get my hopes up and I'll, I'll get in a really good routine. I'll be happy back here and and whatnot, and then you're just gonna ship us all away. She's mm. just like, oh, we might as well, might as well stay away. And so yeah, we um, we ended up uh, signed to go to France and go to Lyon. And I know the coach Kenny Lynn. Um, I played with him. Oh yeah, is he the head coach? Oh, true. 
well, he's he's the backs coach, but I think him and the head coach um, have like sort of like a dual role. And yeah, but he he speaks fluent French, and obviously I know him, and he knows me. So I think that's that's uh, a real bonus of, mm. of sort of heading to Lyon. And so yeah, that's that's where we're heading now. We're, we're heading to Lyon on another adventure. And that's just a one year deal this time. Nah, that's a that's a that's a two plus one. Oh, is it? Jeez, you've gone yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> You're in it. So we're, we're, yeah, well, I'm 30 now, bro. So yeah. I know I've probably only got, you know, like this one. And, you know, if I can strap my knees hard <laughs> enough and get the tape around them, um, maybe they'll hold me up for, for one more after that, you know? Yeah. And then I'll, uh, and then I'll come home. But yeah, that's, um, that's where we're at with that. And mm. yeah, look, at, look, really excited for it, to be fair. I, I think the learnings and, and the things I experienced in the UK will definitely help us sort of not only on the field but off the field. Yeah, and that's one thing a lot of people don't realise when they see players making these decisions is your family, your partner and your kids. I mean, moving them to other countries is, is a big deal and having to settle the whole family in at a new place. So like you say, it makes a lot of sense to stay over there until you come back and settle. And I'm guessing your kids will be about school age that time. So they don't have to move schools and things like that. There's all these little things in the background that no one sees about a rugby player's decision. They just see, oh, Lima's off to Leon. Yes, yeah. So, like, there's a lot of factors that come into it. So, I mean, you know, when you're, when you're moving overseas, you're obviously giving up stuff as well. You know, you're giving up the chance to be around your, your own family. You know, I've got brothers and sisters and some of my brothers got kids as well and just missing that as well. Mm-hmm. And, my missus, um, her brothers have kids as well. And so we, we do miss that. And but you can't have everything in life, you know. So mm-hmm. we, we've decided to sort of just stay on this overseas journey and, and try and really um, embrace it all and experience it all. Because we know when we come back to New Zealand, we'll be coming back and that's that. And we'll never be going all the way over the other mm-hmm. side of the world again. It was too fucking far. <laughs> <laughs> so would you look to come back at the end of that and have one more stint in New Zealand one more swan song with maybe the canes and lions or stags I know a lot of yeah. questions are coming about you and returning to the stags you obviously <laughs> had a big impact down there with the boys <laughs> yeah I, I, I wouldn't have a clue like, I think you know by the time I finish this contract I think I'll be 32 yeah I'll be 32 so you know, maybe I might do one more year overseas I'd really love to get to Japan you know mm. I'd really love to get there as well and experience life there I reckon that'll be bloody cool to be able to say I've um, you know played in New Zealand and UK and France and Japan but yeah you know, we'll just just got to keep the body healthy and, and play as well as I can and then you know, that'll let me decide where I can go eventually mm. that's it and life after footy plans not too sure yet I think that's what I've got to sort of get locked down now over the next five years and, and sort of work out what, what I want to do. I wasn't I wasn't too sure about coaching. I thought I might want to get it get away from rugby. But, mm. but now I'm kind of like, oh, actually, I wouldn't mind having a good crack at coaching and um, just seeing seeing where that could take me. And your podcast? You, I haven't seen your podcast up and running recently. What's happened there? That was that was hissing while it was going. What? Yeah, boy, boys have been on furlough, man. Been on furlough. <laughs> no government funding. Man. We're, we're on furlough at the moment. Now we've just been slack, bro. Yeah, honestly, we've just been slack and useless on it. Uh, to be fair, but yeah, it is. It is quite cool uh, podcasting, isn't it? Um, as you would know, you get to kind of talk to some pretty cool people. And, yeah, and hear their stories, and you know, you get to really um, understand somebody or. Uh, like see why they do stuff or you know some of the experiences they have and um it is, it is really cool but yeah we've just been slack bro <laughs> <laughs> is it something you'd look to push later on or see how you go yeah i think so i think so i think um yeah we just got to sit down and have a proper think about what what you want to do and um probably a bit like yourself it's just like just getting the reps in constantly and just you know, eventually just building up momentum, isn't it? Trying to be consistent, eh? That's the hardest thing. I mean, yeah, consistent. If you can get out regular, consistent episodes, then 
people seem to listen but as soon as you drop off for like a week it's like oh where have they all gone <laughs> yeah 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 that's a bit like us I'm, I, I still get messages like yo is the podcast coming out like, oh, yeah <laughs> yeah and then it's the same guy who asked me again six months later like, What's the, what? oh, sorry bro yeah we're trying we're trying <laughs> yeah well it'll be good to have it back on there but as always we've gone to our instagram for some questions we do have a lot of questions but i'll race through some Heaps of these questions were, would you come back to the Canes? Would you come back to the Stags? Everyone wants you to return to the Mighty Canes. Uh, first question from Marty Banks. What did he give Brownie to get 100% game time and zero training minutes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my days. Oh, that guy's funny, eh? He, to be fair, he did do a lot of my reps for me, to be honest. Like, I was, yeah. Poor but bloke, it yeah. paid off in the end, eh? In the final. Yeah, it paid off for you, Big C. Top trainer, though. Top trainer. Probably most meters during the week, but come, come game day, he's only fucking run on the pitch after the game, you know? Doing the extra fitness with the trainer. Poor bloke. Oh, oh good stuff. Okay. Who wins it in a run it straight between you and your brother, Tupac? Oh. Older brother always thinks he can, but fuck, he'll definitely steamroll me. Eh? But <laughs> I, I, I'd probably, I'd probably like lay my life on the line not to get bowled over. Eh? He has the older brother. That was a gear tactic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just you just have to throw it at you and, and see what happens. But is is he playing for the Cook Islands in a few weeks against the Mighty Marker? I saw his name on the squad. Yeah, he is. He reckons he's captain. Is he? He goes, oh man, I'm. I'm just like my cousin Sonny Bill Williams, the Jewel International. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bro, you're an idiot. The boys are going to have to watch out for him. So he thinks, yeah, I'm like Sonny Bill, Jewel International. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's classic. Okay, Richard Buckman or Marty Banks? They're good for different reasons, but if I'm in a, if I'm in a dark alley and I, it's like the 80th minute, sorry, Banksy, you're out there, brother. You're, you're out, mate. The Barracuda's coming in and he's making my tackles for me, bro. I, as soon as you said the dark alley, I knew where that one was going. <laughs> yeah, mate. Okay. Um, would you ever try and play for Samoa? Yeah. To, to be fair, I actually um try to do the switch – like Malakai, yeah. Obviously, Malakai is doing the. Um, he he played in Monaco. I actually wanted to be a part of that uh, with the seven setup, and it just didn't work out because my MIQ voucher was for the sixteenth of June, and we couldn't get it moved so that me and my whole family could come back. Mm. We had already booked our flights and stuff. So oh, we true. Get our, we couldn't book it MIQ voucher for all of us. They could they could book one for for just me, but that was flying from the UK to New Zealand and then doing two weeks quarantine is yeah. that's just a step too far for yeah. businesses, you know. Like that's three kids, three and under. Like that's that that's Tough. that hell on earth, you know. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't I couldn't do that. Yeah, I couldn't do that to her. Yeah. Um, like I really wanted to. Um, but it was it just it, I had to put um, sort of my family first in, yeah. in that situation, and it's just unfortunate that that was the way that it had happened, and I couldn't get I couldn't get back home into the country. Mm. But it's something you're looking to do going forward. Yeah, I would have definitely been keen to do it. That's um, cool. And keen to try and 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 help out Samoa, um, and you know, uh, and and play for them. Yeah, I would have been king for sure. Next World Cup. <laughs> hey, how good would that be? Okay, next one. How much weight and skinnies did you put on in your first South Africa tour? <laughs> oh, this is the pits, bro. <laughs> this is the pits, this question. This is honestly the pits, this question. So my first South Africa tour, I, I think I missed the first four tours. Injuries? Yeah, just injuries. Just um, Yeah, just all injuries. And so the fifth one I made, I was like, yeah, this is it. <laughs> Making like, up for it. it. <laughs> Mate, those milkshakes, hey, <laughs> holy, they are unbelievable. And uh, what is it, those passion fruit lemonades? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the room service, you know, the room service, because everything's so cheap there, you know, like, the yeah. room is so weak. Yeah. You know, like, and even when you're spending New Zealand dollars, you're like, you think you're a millennial. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think 
I think I actually put on like five kilo and I went up like twenty five mil in, <laughs> in two weeks. <laughs> yeah, but I, honestly, I think I was having like I think I averaged like two point two milkshakes a day or something like that. I worked it out. Like, I must have been having a milkshake for breakfast. Game day. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, fucking idiot. <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 I lost the gherkin when I went over there. My first trip, I, I was just like, I can't believe I'm here. I've waited so long for this, you know. Like, <laughs> oh, that's good was, stuff. Okay, last question. What happened between Kate Pocky and James Haskell? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, Anyone who knows Kate, like that guy's, <laughs> like that guy can proper scrap. Eh? Shortest fuse. <laughs> oh mate, shortest fuse, fucking hell! But holy, that guy can fight, man. So yeah, I, essentially what happened? I I cracked the egg on Haskell's head, and everyone starts cracking up, laughing, and like losing the plot at him having an egg cracked on his head. I run back to the wall, and like where I was drinking, I was drinking with Adam Thompson. And Haskell ends up like flying through the fire that we've made in his house. Like we've made this bonfire, and because everyone's kind of like just over Haskell at the time, you know, he can just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. You know, like doesn't shut up. Like funny, funny as guy. Like this time, everyone's just had enough. You know. Like, yeah. And so they they started to chuck all his like clothes in there, his food, like his fucking brown rice getting chucked in the fire. He's he's not having it. You know. <laughs> um. So he comes back flies through the fire like and i'm not talking like a little fire it's like a fucking roaring blaze right now you yeah know? like it's like proper like in the air kind of thing and he like runs through it and i'm just like standing there and he just like bang just drops me like oh, cold true. And i just wake up on yeah like i just wake up on the ground like fuck my jaw is sore man and out of like out of the corner of my eye like cade's cade's seen it and he just sprints across, like, <laughs> from out of nowhere. And he just starts full on, like, ja, 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 ja. like, like, him and Haskell were, like, going into it, bro. Like, ja, 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 ja. And, like, Haskell, like, must have, like, tried to grab him and just, like, just kind of, like, subdue him. And he's, like, ripped his top. And Kate's just, like, ripped his top. And he's just, like, that's my best friend. That's my best friend. <gasps> He's like, Wah! and he's just like, bah, 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 bah. just like they're both going near it. So you know, like, like people are trying to drag him off, and yeah. he's like, he's, like, like he's he's small. You know how big yeah. he is? Yeah. Like fucking five foot six on a good day. Yeah. But like, holy, he is like he. I don't know. He's got like the incredible Hulk in the and he's, Yeah. He just like he just like full on lost today and. And oh, that's Haskell great. had to go and get stitches from A and E. Oh, real nose. Wow. Yeah, because because Kate got him so good, but yeah, it's, it was a it was a good laugh. Mate, good laugh. Kate has your back. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy's <laughs> best friend. The shortest fuse, though. Yeah. <laughs> that's my best friend. <laughs> Funny, dude. Good night, dude. Good what night. a what a yarn! What a yarn to finish, and what a career, mate! What a what a journey that you've been through. It's been. It's been awesome, actually, to just catch up and um, go through your journey like that. Um, lots of things that I, I didn't know and picked up through that. Heaps of heaps of cool advice. Mate, really appreciate you giving up your time to come on the Water Lad podcast. Really appreciate it, mate. Nah, no worries, Jimmy. Thanks, bro. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate what you do. And like I said, I've uh, learned some pretty um, cool things off some of the other people who have been on your show. And I think what you're doing is, is pretty cool. So like you said before, bro, just consistency eh? <laughs> keep banging them out bro. keep banging them out man because uh if you stop bro it, it's hard to get the, it's hard a, to get the you're again, done <laughs> yeah you're, you're done you're washed but uh yeah no nah, thanks for having me on bro and i really appreciate uh coming on and being able to share with you today and glad to know i was able to sort of play a small part in in your career oh well. huge part <laughs> <laughs> mate i'll still be battling around tasman <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good man nah awesome thanks for having me nah I appreciate it thanks mate